And so thank you everyone tonight. Um, I'm Angelica Diggs, the director of the Montclair History Center. And tonight we are really excited to have our um, board of trustee member and township historian, Mike Farrelly, who is really going to give us a nice view of Montclair through his eyes as a historian and discover some of the oldest homes that we may or may not realize. Um, and many of which may surprise us as they don't actually look their age um, at first glance. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're more than 20 miles away or if you're more than one person, put that in the chat. Um, we do have another History at Home coming up later this month for anyone who is interested in the discussion with Charles Brady. Um, it did get rescheduled to May 24th, so we'll send out another reminder for that. And I did put a few things in the chat to take us um, you to our YouTube channel. Um, donations are appreciated as we bring all these events to you for free, and we're really excited. And I'm going to now just hand it over to Mike Farley, and we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, guys. Uh as you can probably uh, figure out, this is about colonial era homes, not colonial architecture. Um, and it's a little bit of a misnomer because uh, technically the colonial era ended at the end of the revolution in 1783. And some of the houses that I'm gonna talk to talk about uh, were built after 1783, but I kind of, fudge the uh, definition a little bit to include them. Uh, as Angelica says, there are quite a few homes that were modified uh, years ago and they don't look like they did when they were uh, two room, one and a half story farmhouses. Uh, they've changed. And uh, also I uh, a little bit of a expansion. I included a couple of the houses, uh, not necessarily in Montclair, but in the area. Uh, I'm starting with this, this house. This house uh, it's the oldest house in the area, and it stunned me when I first heard about it. Oh boy, share screen. Is it not letting you progress, Mike? It is not letting me progress. Are you clicking on the screen or just using the mouse keyboard? I'm using the mouse keyboard. Oh, here we go. Okay. Good. The oldest house in the area is in Belleville on Main Street. And you can see it from Route 21 as you pass by. It was built in 1690. And it was a parsonage for uh, the Dutch Reformed Church, which is a, about a half a block away. Um, the Lloyd family acquired it in the 1820s, and they took real good care of it. They also um, put the stucco on the front. They changed the roof line. So from the front, it really doesn't look quite as old as it actually is. Uh, if you look at it, as you come up Main Street, uh, you look at the side of the house, uh, you can see a little more clearly just how old the house is. Uh, I was not allowed on the property. It's still, this house is still a private house. So I went back to the 1930s to find a picture of the back of the house. In the 1930s, uh, during the depression, uh, the Works Progress Administration found work for young writers and architects and engineers by sending them out and going and taking pictures and doing drawings and doing uh, surveys and studies of the oldest houses in America. And this was one of them. So this is a picture from 1936. And you can tell uh, by the looking at the windows, at least the, you see those windows in the little bit of wing that's in the back. They're very small. Uh, and there's a reason for that uh, in the, in that, era, the 1690s, uh, there were no glass factories in the United States. They all had all glass had to come from Europe. And it was easier and safer to ship small panes of glass. So you, one of the clues to a very old house is are those small panes of glass that you see there in that 1936 picture. Uh, I told you they sent architects and engineers out to do drawings. And this is the drawings, some of the drawings that they did of that house. Uh, John Lloyd and his father were American. 
but they were in Canada when the, at the outbreak of the War of 1812, and they refused to sign an allegiance to the king. Uh, they hid out in the swamps for a couple of months. Uh, then they were arrested and they were thrown into jail for a couple of months. And finally, they were deported. They were escorted to the border of Canada and released back into the United States. They ended up in Pennsylvania. And John arrived in Belleville around 1824. And he married uh, a Girolaman. And some of you have or know uh, Girolam, Girolaman Avenue is in the uh, main thoroughfare in Nutley, in Belleville, sorry. He, uh, John was a tailor. He became a lawyer, a justice of the peace, and the local postmaster. And he was also the local coroner. This is the house, another picture of the house. This is the church I'm talking about, but that is not the church that was there in 1690. That is the fifth church that was on that was built on that site. So the first church goes back to the 1690s when uh, uh, Domini Berthoff was the uh, pastor. Uh, but like I said, it was a much smaller, much different church. This is the fifth church on the site. Almost as old, we hop over to Nutley. Uh, there is a little bit of a dis there a little bit of a controversy. Uh, the records are evenly divided. Some people say that the original house that was built by the Bradburys uh, is still standing, and they believe that it is this portion of the house. There are other people and other documents that believe that the original house was knocked down. And some other pictures of the house. Uh, when I took pictures of the house, it was not in particularly very good condition. There is an organization now that is trying to rebuild it and they have completed some of the work. They've raised some of the money and completed some of the work. As I told you, the original house is just the small wing. The big wing, the one that is most obvious from the road, was built in 1788. Uh, John and Elizabeth's son, Richard, inherited the house. Uh, the will stipulated that he make uh, stipends, give payments to his sisters. Uh, he couldn't do that. So the sister Elizabeth got it and she married Abraham Van Ripper. And their son, John Van Ripper, married Leah Winnie in 1776. And they're the ones who enlarged the house. I went to the back of the house and took a picture of this stone and it says I L John and Leah Van Ripper. You have to remember the convention was to use uh, some of the Roman lettering and the Romans did not have a letter J. So oftentimes somebody who was named John or James would have in Latin, the name would start with an I. So that's where you see that. Anyway, after many years, many changed many hands. The house was sold to it and uh, They sold it to developers. The developers built it all around the house and they sold it back to the town. And the town is leasing it to the Van Ripper House uh, organization. And they are the ones who are trying to restore the building and grounds. Now let's get to Montclair. There's a little bit of a problem with determining the oldest house in Montclair. The one with the best documentation, the one that we are sure goes actually goes back that far, has been changed enormously, so much so that it's almost not even fair to call that the original house. Uh, some of the other candidates for the oldest house we are not quite as sure about the documentation of how old they go back, how far they go back. Um, so we have some questions. I believe the oldest house in Montclair is this house. It's on Valley Road at the corner of Alexander Avenue and Valley Road. The documents are pretty clear that it goes back to 1740 uh, by Johanna, was built by Johannes and Janetja Van Wickel. 
as I said, this house has been heavily modified and it might not even be fair to call this house the original house. Uh, it was bought by uh, Amos and Henrietta Broadnax, and we'll talk about them in a few seconds, in 1863. And then uh, George and Racina de Cuna bought it in 1881, and they are the ones who changed it dramatically. Uh, by the way, I had to make a note. Uh, when I first put this presentation together, the owners of the house wouldn't allow me to take a picture. So I had to use a picture from the 1981 uh, preservation survey. I did kind of sneak in and get a picture after it changed owners a few years later. I told you that Amos and Henrietta Brodnax owned the house. And this is a clip from the New York uh, Montclair Times when they owned it. And if you blow this picture up, you can take and take a good look at the foundation. You will see that the foundation is very similar. It, it's the same foundation that uh, was exposed a few years, years ago uh, during a renovation. The house, the foundation has now got bushes in front of it and you can't see it. This is the Broadnax family, Amos, Henrietta, and their son, William. Uh, it's George de Cuna who really built the present house. He was an architect and he basically tore the original house down, but left the foundation. So the foundation is really all that's left of the original house. So is it the oldest house? You can argue it several different ways. Now, another house that goes back quite far is this house on Wachung Avenue. I could, I push the documentation back to 1778. Definitely, Nicholas P. and Mary Garibrandt owned, built this house, or owned, they lived in this house. There is some speculation that it is older, that it went back to 1724 uh, and built was built by Peter Classe, Klaes, I'm not even sure how you pronounce that. Uh, he was also known as Van Neuklos. The, he was Dutch, and Dutch people were not real concerned with their last names at the time. The first name was the important name. And so they're oftentimes in public records, their names changed. Uh, the person who did the research that thinks the house goes back to 1724 based her research on name changes. You know, she guessed that certain people were, were the Van Neuklos. Uh, there are records that a guy by the name of Van Neuklos built a, a house in Montclair in 1724. She believes, uh, Mary Orney, her name was, uh, she believed that her house was an extension of Van Neuklos's house. Anyway, I, I definitely pushed the deeds back as back as far as 1778. Oh, by the way, the deeds that would have gone back to 1724 don't exist any longer. There's there, you go to the hall of records, there is the book one is gone. That would be all the deeds that go back that far. So it's questionable. Um, the people who modified this house were the Little Johns, Harry and Charlotte. Uh, Harry was a Civil War hero. He was a lieutenant in the Union Army guarding Washington, D.C. And in 1861, he and a very small band of soldiers held off a large band of Confederates at the Fifth Dam along the Potomac River. He's the one, he came to Montclair after the war. And he is the one who bought the, took this little house and built a much larger Victorian house. And it's the house that we are more familiar with now. Uh, in the early 20th century, this was home to Reverend Thomas and Mary Travis. And Reverend Thomas was the pastor of the Wachung Congregational Church. Uh, their daughter, Mary, 
Robert, Ron Robert Orney. And he lived in a house just on the other side of the Wachung Congregational Church. And I had some classes with uh, Mary Orney was a, uh, a teacher and historian. And I had some classes when I was in Montclair State. Uh, I had some classes with her. She would tell stories about her house. And her husband, <laughs> and of course she meant geographically, not uh, emotionally. And she wrote a book about the house called Seasoned with Salt, and their daughter uh, lives there now. This is an artist's conception, what the artist believes the original house looks like, looked like. It's an artist's conception. We don't know for sure if that's what the house looked like or not. In the mid 19th century, the house looked like it did on the left. That's when Abraham Zeke owned the house. Now, Abraham married a guy by the uh, uh, Christian interest. He married his, uh, Christian interest's daughter, Vruti. And that is another reason why Mary Arney believes that the house uh, goes back to 1724. Uh, she believed that Christian interest lived in that house uh, during the revolution. Christian interest was a German soldier who deserted uh, lived in lived in Montclair. Well, she thinks he lived in Montclair. I think he lived in Bloomfield. Um, and he would hide every time there was rumor that there were English troops in the area because he was a deserter and he didn't want to get found, so he would hide. I found other records that say Christian Interest's house was in Bloomfield on in Wachung Avenue. So I can't be sure that this particular house, the one at 149 Wachung, I can't be sure that that was really von Neukles's house or Christian Interest's house. Um, here is a picture of the uh, house, house on the right is just after the Little Johns uh, enlarged it. We'll jump to another house that could possibly be the oldest house in Montclair. It is known as the Jeremiah Crane House, um, but he was born in 1770. There are some records that say that it goes back to 1740, so maybe, just maybe, his parents built it, and that would have been Stephen and Rhoda Crane. Possibly they built the house. And then Jeremiah inherited, possibly inherited it. He married Elizabeth Cor Corby and raised 11 kids in this house. But the house didn't look like it does now. It was the house that he lived in and had 11 kids in was only the lower floor of the current house. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a few seconds. Uh, in 1860, a guy by the name of Abathar Harrison bought the house from uh, William Crane, who was Jeremiah and Elizabeth's son. Abathar came from Orange, and he started a road back to his family home. That's Harrison Avenue. In 1868, a very wealthy man by the name of Pomp Thomas Porter and his brother Nathan bought Jeremiah's farm. Thomas modernized the old farmhouse, added the second floor, and lived there while he was building his mansion on Union Street. And that's a picture of the mansion on Union Street. That house has been demolished. I have been inside the Jeremiah Crane house. Uh, some of the owners invited me in one time. Uh, I've often done the, uh, the there's, a, there's an annual uh, historical walk that the Renaissance School does and they visit various sites in Montclair uh, and there are people who will uh, stand there and talk about the various sites. 
And one time uh, when I was standing outside of this house, the owners invited me in. It is very, the ceilings are very low in the basement. Uh, and you can see the, the, there used to be rough hewn planks there. They have been replaced, but you can tell that the basement, the cellar, was originally a very low house. And then if you've been reading the, uh, the text while I was talking, uh, you will notice that uh, in the 1990s, uh, Reverend Nicholas Cook and his wife Ellen lived in, the, in this house. And she worked her way up to treasurer of the uh, National Episcopal Church and ran into a little bit of trouble when she embezzled $1.5 million from the National Church and went to prison. Now we're gonna look at some houses that look their age. And we have another little problem here because this house technically isn't in Montclair, it's in Little Falls, but it's only a few feet away from the Montclair border. And when it was built, Little Falls was in Essex County. It was built probably by Reiner and Maria Spear in 1788. Uh, and then remain the Spear family household for many, many years. It could have possibly been built by Reiner's father, Johannes. Um, the whole area, there were so many Spears in the area, the area was known as Spear Town. Uh, Reiner and Maria had a son, John. Uh, he married Leah and they moved into the house. Uh, he was a justice of the peace. Their son married Charity Man Mandeville and moved to Little Falls, but they came back after John and Leah passed away. This Reiner, who was the grandson of the original Reiner, was a justice of peace, but he was a sportsman and he loved to hunt and he converted the house to a hotel, which he opened up on weekends. They called it the Sportsman Hotel. And it was dedicated primarily to people who liked to hunt and fish. On the left-hand side, I just took a little bit of a close-up picture of the uh, foundation of the house. This is a lousy picture that I took back in the 1990s. It is a lousy picture, but there wasn't as much uh, growth around the house. So it is a clearer picture. It's a lousy picture, but it shows the house a little bit better. And uh, Peter was the last of the Spears to live in the house. And they lived there to about 1934. Another house that looks old is the Sigler de Forest house, 1786. We have some pretty good documentation for that house. It's on Valley Road down by, uh, just as you, if you're going uh, uh, north, it's just a little bit before you get to King's uh, supermarket. It was built by Daniel and Jane Sigler. Uh, that was only the back portion, the back portion where my cursor is. That's the original house here. This bigger portion was added in 1817. Um, here is a 1930s picture of the same house, uh, again, done, done by the WPA. Uh, this is the other side of the house. Again, the, you can't even see the original house uh, in this picture. Uh, the uh, Israel and Mary DeForest, who lived in Brooklyn, started using this house as a summer house, and they moved in in 1880, not 1891. Again, the WPA investigated this house. They did drawings. This is the original house here. And here is a photograph of the original house. Um, Joseph Sigler had two children, was Mary Jane and Clement. Clement 
was judged incompetent. So they had he had some sort of physical disability or men mental disability, and they judged that he was not competent to uh, be the rightful owner of the house. So they the the courts awarded the house to Mary Jane. Uh, she married a guy by the name of Kirstead, Isaac Kirstead. The farm at that time ran all the way down to Grove Street, and Mary Jane and Isaac built a house down on Grove Street. But their kids converted one of the barns to the current 400 Grove Street. Again, another lousy picture. That's 400 Grove Street. Another house that looks old, and surprisingly, this house was modified and modified to look old. Uh, it was built in 1786 for Walling Egbert. Uh, and the Egberts were a Dutch family that owned about 400 acres in the at the top of the mountain. And this is, an, this is what the house looked like before 1900. Or in 1900, before the renovations. You can't really tell uh, if you look at the lintel over the door, it's the, the letters W and E and the date 1786 are carved into the lintel. The WE stands for uh, Walling Egbert and the 1786 of course is the date. Uh, after Walling died, his brother Garrett moved in and we are going to hear about Garrett Egbert again in a few minutes. In 1836, Joseph Munn, and we'll hear about him later too, bought this house for his son, Calvin. In 1910, uh, Montclair architect A.F. Norris hired, was hired to refurbish the house and he managed to modernize it without losing that colonial era feel. This is a picture of the house that appeared in the uh, Images of America by Elizabeth and Royal Shepherd. Royal Shepherd was the town historian before me, and he lived in the house when he was a boy. Okay, this house, one of them for me is one of the most famous houses in Montclair. This is one of the houses that I will throw myself in front of the bulldozers if they ever try to knock it down. This house, the original portion of it, the rear portion, was built in 1788 by Garrett Egbert. It was, <clears throat> it's now a couple houses down from, uh, this is 118 North Mountain. The Walling Egbert house was 128 North Mountain. This was only a couple of houses down now. But back then in 1780s, they were next door neighbors. Changed This house changed house, changed hands probably 40 times between the time Garrett Egbert owned it and Lucy Stone owned it. Lucy Stone is the very famous advocate for women's suffrage and abolition. This is she is probably the reason why I will throw myself in front of the bulldozers for this house. It was already modified by the time she lived here in 1858. Um, she was the president of uh, I can't even the talking about Lucy Stone is a presentation all by itself. I can't even mention all the things that she did. Uh, tireless advocate for women's rights and for uh, abolition of slavery. She traveled all over the country, gave speeches all over the place, was incredibly active. And I just can't even, we can't even cover it all in the few minutes that we have here. Uh, she, Lucy only owned it. Well, she owned it for a long time, but they only lived there for three years. Uh, she owned the property, and it was about 30 acres along with this house uh, until 1893. And she rented it out, even though she lived in other places. She had a little bit of a fight with Susan B. Anthony. Uh, they formed separate women's suffrage organizations. 
Uh, there was a little bit of bad blood between them, but they re the groups reunited in 1888 uh, with Alice Stone uh, being the major reason why the two groups to get get together. Alice was uh, Lucy's daughter. And she married a guy by the name of Henry Blackwell. And Alice was that Black's name was actually Alice Blackwell. Lucy did not want to take Henry's last name, and he did not insist that she take his last name. They had a very unusual marriage, and Henry supported her in all her activities. Um, in fact, he took over the woman's journal when she passed away and remained the editor until his death in 1908. Uh, then the house went through another bunch of uh, owners until the Brewer family bought it. And the uh, Maryland broker, uh, Stoker Brewer, uh, renovated the house in the 1930s. Alice, this is Lucy Stone, her Blackwell with her daughter Alice as a baby. Uh, Alice was only a couple months old when they when they moved from Orange into the, the house on uh, North Mountain Avenue. The whole family was amazing. Her sister-in-law was Reverend Antoinette, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who was the first female ordained minister in the United States. Another sister-in-law was Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who was the first woman to graduate from medical school and the first woman to be a board-certified physician in the United States. She started the Infirmary for Women and Children in 1857, and then they added a medical college in 1868. Another sister-in-law, uh, Emily Blackwell, continued to run the infirmary and the medical college after Elizabeth went back to England in the 1869. Uh, she and Elizabeth had a summer house on, uh, well, it would have been on Upper Mountain Avenue. Uh, it has been demolished. It is no longer there. And when, after she retired from running the hospital in New York, she uh, lived on Plymouth Street. This is a picture of the Blackwell family shortly after they moved in. So this picture is taken about 1858, 1859. And this is, this is what the house looked like then and it still looks like today. Uh, this was Kitty Barry, who was uh, Elizabeth Blackwell's adopted daughter. And she is holding baby Alice in this picture sitting in another rock locking chair in the back looking facing the camera is Antoinette Brown Blackwell. Uh, not facing the camera is Elizabeth Blackwell. And then the two men on the porch were Samuel, Samuel who was Antoinette's um, husband, and George Blackwell, who was another brother. Uh, he was a brother-in-law of Lucy Stone. Okay, now it comes to the Howe House. This was built for the Howe House slaves, the Howe House, the Crane family slaves, about 1780. You know, none of these houses have building permits. They, you didn't need a building permit to build a house back then. So the records are not real clear. If you own the property, you could build a house. There were no building codes. There were no setbacks. You could, if you had the property and you wanted to build a house, you could build a house. And there was no reason you didn't have to get a permit. So there's very little documentation on a lot of these houses because they were just built by the people who owned the property. Anyway, the Cranes owned a large farm at this area. This would have been uh, running from, the farm would have run from Park Street up, uh, through Valley Road, up Claremont Avenue, all the way to the top of the hill. And that would have been the original farm. Uh, it was owned by William Crane. Uh, William Crane, his nephew, Major Nathaniel Crane, married 
Hannah Crane, William's daughter, and Nathaniel came to manage the farm, own the slaves, and in 1817, he freed James Howe. And in 1831, in his will, he gave the house and six acres and 400 bucks to James. James lived there with his wife, Susan, and their children, James, uh, Henry, who went by the name of Henry and Delilah. Uh, in 1844, James sold a quarter of an acre to Francis and Mary Oliver, who built a little house next door. That house is no longer there. By 1878, the six acres had been broken up and the Olivers lived in the Howe house. In 1904, Theron Oliver and his mom sold the house to Louise Becker. Uh, we Howe house historians, I am one of the Howe house historians, are desperately trying to figure out who the heck Louise Becker was. We don't know very much about her. She didn't live in the Howe house, but she did live with the people in the house in the foreground for a short while. This house here, that's a 24 Upper Mountain. She did live there as a boarder for a little while. Um, in 1899, uh, Blanton and Emily Benson of Welsh bought the corner lot and they built 24 Upper Mountain. That's this, this house here. Uh, at some point, and we're not totally sure when, they knocked down the little Oliver house and some point they acquired the Howe house. And their daughter, Emily, married a guy by the name of Paul Wigan, and they renovated the Howe House in 1929. Now, this house probably looks very familiar to a lot of the people on in the audience here tonight. This is the Israel Crane House. It was built in 1796 by a very young Israel Crane. He was only 22 when he built it. It was not originally a three-story house. It was a two-story house and looked a little bit different. Uh, but James uh, Crane, his son, uh, and his wife, Phoebe, put on the third floor and gave it that kind of Greek revival look that it has today. And as most of the people in the audience probably know, the house was not originally on Orange Road. It was on Glenridge Avenue. And in the 1920s, from the 1920s to the 1960s, it served as the colored YWCA in town, the only YWCA in town. Here's some other pictures of the uh, house. It was moved, as I've said. The kitchen looked a little bit like the current kitchen, but the current kitchen, that's a reconstruction. That was not moved when the whole when the house was moved. It was rebuilt and rebuilt to look like the original kitchen. There was also a wing coming off of the back of the house that was not moved. There is, if you look real close, there is a little window cut into the rear of the house that shows the wattle and daub insulation. Uh, that was mud that was basically mixed with straw and shoved in between the wooden boards. And they use that for insulation. Uh, the WPA did do a study of this house. And they, uh, in 1936, this is an interior shot uh, from the house. Does anybody, uh, which, which room is that? Does anybody from the, who does the crane houses tours know which room that is now? That's one of the back rooms. It was the Borders dining room during the YWCA period, Mike. Okay, great. Thank you. The Borders dining room. Okay. Uh, on the right is the original kitchen. That was. Uh, they took a picture of that in the 1930s, and then this is the back of the the current reconstructed kitchen. It it was reconstructed to look a lot like the original kitchen. Israel, an amazing guy, 
a heck of a businessman. If there had been railroads when he was alive, he would have been a railroad tycoon. Instead, he was just a tycoon of every other business that he could think of. He was uh, one of the commissioners of the Morris Canal. Uh, in fact, his daughter, Eliza, married the surveyor who laid out the canal. He was one of the commissioners of the Nork and, Palm Tur P Nork and Pompton Turnpike. Uh, which was a toll road, which went from Newark at his stone quarry. He owned a stone quarry in Newark and ran up to Pine Brook with a, and split off at the top of the mountain where a branch went off uh, kind of roughly following Route 23 and went off to the iron mines in Passaic County. Uh, Israel became president of the turnpike and then the sole owner when he died it was sold to Essex County and became Bloomfield Avenue. And the the part that ran along the top of the mountain, uh, you can see it, it's called the Old Nork Pompton Turnpike, and it kind of runs parallel to Route 23 now. Israel ran a general store and a cider mill. He bought property down at Tunney's Brook near Bay Street, jam dammed up Tunney's Brook, started a cotton mill, and he started another cotton mill in Patterson. Like I said, remarkable businessman. He was probably the wealthiest guy in Montclair when at the during the time period, which would have been the late 1700s and early 1800s. His son, James, uh, took over the store after uh, Israel had passed on. And as I said, in 1920, it became the Colored YWCA, uh, where it became a place for young African-American women to stay and for young African-American women to be mentored. Uh, this is a picture that was taken, I think, in front of that same uh, fireplace in the Borders uh, kitchen. Um, don't know who all these people were. This, I'm going to say uh, Martha Bell Williams is down here at the end. Uh, Martha, uh, late, she was Martha Bell. She married Joseph Williams, and she became one of the two first African-American women to become lawyers in the state of New Jersey. The, when this house was the colored YWCA, it was really the place to be for young African-American women. Uh, it was the center of life. They were mentored there. They took cooking classes there, sewing classes. It was just, it was, well, it was the place to be. And I think that's the, uh, the name of the documentary about the YWCA in Montclair. Anyway, in the 1950s, the place was, they, the YWCA had become fully integrated. They were planning a bigger modern building on Glen Ridge Avenue. And remember, this house was originally on Glen Ridge Avenue. Uh, so the house started falling into disrepair. And in 1965, they threatened to tear it down. In 1965, the Montclair Historical Society was formed, money was raised, and the house was moved to its present location on Orange Road. And I think they did it in like two months. They raised the money, found the property, moved the house up Bloomfield Avenue. And they couldn't move the kitchen or the back wing, but they moved the main house to its present location. In the back of the crane house is the Nat Crane house. This is not the whole house. This is just an addition that was built onto the original house in 1818. Uh, there was a house, an old house that was sitting where the Clark house sits now. Uh, this was part of that house, the house that was sitting on the Clark house property now. It was built for Nathaniel Crane and his wife, Rebecca. 
there is some disagreement among who Nathaniel Crane was. There were dozens of Nathaniel Crane, Nathaniel Cranes in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Some records say it was Nathaniel Jr. And there was a Nathaniel Jr., but he died young and he was never married. I believe that this Nathaniel Crane was the son of Joseph, uh, Joseph Crane, who would have been the grandson of the original Nathaniel Crane, who had a house on Myrtle, Myrtle Street. In 1863, Dr. James Henry and Cordelia Clark bought the old house that was on directly, you know, immediately on Orange Road. He was an eye doctor. Uh, he practiced in Newark. His son, James Henry, James Henry, was also a doctor. And he and his wife, Carrie, moved the main portion of the old Nathaniel Crane house back to the back lot, uh, more or less where it sits today. It was actually moved a couple of times and before it ended up exactly where it is now. This is what I'm trying to say, that the, the house that we're familiar with now, the house that exists now, was only this portion of the original house. And we don't know when the original house was built. It's obviously old. We don't know exactly when the original house was built. There is a date stone underneath the, the current Nat Crane house. We are not sure that it came from the original house. Um, it this you can you can't really read it in the picture, but it is it is I with a heart in the between E and then V on top of it and the date 1732. Again, remember the Romans didn't have a letter for the letter J, so I stands for John. E stands for Elizabeth, the V stands for John and Elizabeth Vincent, who were married in 1732. Now, Nathaniel Crane married Rebecca, her last name, her maiden name was Harrison, and she was the daughter of Moses Harrison and Sarah Vincent. I think that the Vincents, John and Elizabeth, built their house somewhere in the area. And uh, Nathaniel and Rebecca got the stone when the when the, the original the Vincent home was torn down, and they just incorporated it in their house uh, to honor her ancestors. Here is a surprise house that nobody really knows much about and very often shocked to find that it exists. This is the Josiah Crane House. It was built in 1797. It is now standing on 50 Moon North Mountain on the other side of the Van Dyke Mount, Man, uh, Manor. It is really strange that somehow the Van Dyke Manor had two 18th century houses on their property for some reason. Now, it wasn't originally at 50 North Mountain. It was closer to Claremont Avenue. Um, it was at the corner of Claremont and North Mountain. Um, Joseph and Amanda Van Bleck bought Josiah Crane's house and farm. Uh, they lived in the house for a little while they had a very famous architect of the time design a great big house for them in the Van Vleck Gardens. I have the Henry Hudson Holly House is gone, but it stood there about where the parking lot for the uh, Van Vleck Mansion is now. And while they were having Henry Hudson Holly design this, the big house for them, uh, they lived in this little house that had been the Josiah Crane's house. And for some reason, they moved it not far, but they moved it back from the corner to its current position at 50 North Mountain. Okay, 
go down to Grove Street. And this house at 228 Grove Street was built in 1801. Uh, Jacob and Peter Garibrandt bought the property and it was about 16 acres back then in 70, 1796 for 96 New Jersey pounds. The United States Mint was created in uh, 1793, but money had not circulated, American currency had not circulated throughout all the states yet. So a lot of the states, including New Jersey, were still using the old English money. And New Jersey had its own pounds. Uh, so that's what uh, Peter and Jacob uh, used in uh, 1796. Uh, Jacob married a distant cousin, uh, also a Garibrandt. He got a mortgage in 1801, and he built the front portion of this house. Here we go. Uh, the Rikers owned a heap of property down on the south end. Uh, David uh, married Joanna Baldwin. The Baldwins also had a heap of property down on the south end. And in 1802, they built, uh, David and Joanna built this house. Here's a couple other shots of the same house. Uh, as I said, both the Rikers and the Baldwins had a great deal of property down on the south end. Also in 1802, the Munn Tavern. Uh, this shot is taken from the parking lot, uh, not far, uh, kind of, well, Dunkin' Donuts, I think, is gone now, but kind of where Dunkin' Donuts used to be on Bloomfield Avenue by the parking lot across from the police station. Uh, if you stand in that parking lot and look in between those buildings, you can see the original uh, Munn Tavern. It was built in 1802, and Joseph and Martha Munn lived there until 1822, when Joseph built a new tavern. The new tavern is gone. The new tavern stood where the parking lot is now. The old tavern was on Church Street. Uh, it was originally at the corner of Church Street and Valley Road, but was moved uh, by the Swedish Congregational Church. And sometime after 1890, because that's when the Swedish Congregational Church uh, was found, founded, they moved it from the corner and used it as a shelter. This is the, this is the church that it is behind. Uh, they used it as a shelter for young women, Swedish of Swedish origin. Uh, who needed home housing. Uh, it went through a few different congregations. It ended up being the Evangelical Covenant Church, um, in two, and, but they closed in 2013. I don't know what has happened to it since 2013. I heard that some artistic group bought it. Um, I'm not sure. Is, is, is Elaine Fiveland on the on the in the audience? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, you probably know more about this church and the Munn Tavern than anybody else, right? Right. The Munn Tavern, very briefly, was bought by Christina Johnson, who worked for the Board of Education, and she took and moved it. She was the one that moved it as her private residence, and okay. she lived there, and she did have boarders, girls that were coming into the United States, and they lived on her, her second and third floor. And if somebody was sick in a family, like scarlet fever, she took in the children so they wouldn't get the, the scarlet fever and so forth. And then they, she gave it to the church um, when oh, she okay. was older. And so um, it was like probably the 1920s or so when she gave it to the church, although she continued to live upstairs until she died. Okay. But now the, a couple bought the property they were going to talk, turn it into an art center, and I have no idea what they're doing either, okay. except they sold the Munn Tavern. They turned yeah, it into- I, I think that's um, a private house now, isn't it? Yes, it is. They yeah. sold it for well over a million dollars. Yep. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, we'll go down to the whole other, down to the north end of town, 
and it is the John Ziegler House was built in 1815. Uh, it is John Ziegler Sr. built it for his son, John Ziegler Jr. and his wife, Matilda Coyman. There were so many Coymans who lived along Alexander Avenue at the time that they called, called that Coyman Town. Um, it was called, the Alexander Avenue was called Coyman Town Road. Uh, and they called the whole section Coyman Town until the Siglers bought it. Uh, the Siglers bought the southern, southern side of Alexander Avenue. Uh, the Von Rippers bought 53 acres and the house up on the north side of Alexander Avenue. Um, it eventually, it passed through a few Van Ripper hands. It eventually ended up belonging to Thomas Van Ripper, who didn't live there. He owned it. Uh, he is the guy who lived at the uh, Van Ripper Bond house up on uh, upper, uh, Montclair State. Anyway, there was, as I told you, there were a heap of Coymans who lived on along Alexander Avenue. This house is not in Montclair, it's in Bloomfield and it's not that old. It was built in 1855, but Rachel Coyman and was the widow of Jacob Coyman and her kids built this house for her on Broad Street at the corner of Alexander Avenue after their father had passed. Now we're gonna to go to a few houses that really have been changed dramatically and all that's left is really just a couple of hints of their age and what they used to look like. They really not quite, they don't look like they, they don't no longer look like they used to. Uh, this house is totally gone. This was William and Mercy Crane's house. I told you uh, that the Howe House was actually built on William and Mercy Crane's farm, which went from Park Street all the way up to the top of the mountain. Uh, this was the house that William and Mercy lived in and Nathaniel Crane married their daughter, Hannah. The house that you're looking at the picture of, that house is gone. Uh, here's another picture of it, gone. But look in the foreground of the picture, you see a great big boulder. Well, that boulder is still here. They moved that to the corner and put up a plaque. And the plaque shows the image of the original house. Uh, it, the house get a little bit of, gained a little bit of notoriety when George Washington stayed there in 1780. Uh, George Washington, uh, 1780 was a bad year for Continental, for the Continental Army. George Washington desperately wanted a victory. Uh, he wanted to claim something, anything as a victory. His, at the time he was staying at the Day Mansion in Wayne. Uh, in November, late September and early November of 1780, he moved into the house that we saw, the, the old house that we saw the picture of, William and Mercy Crane's house. He stayed there and used that as his headquarters. He and Lafayette moved to Montclair. The plan was for Lafayette to, uh, to attack a Hessian supply depot on Staten Island. Uh, they calculated that there was gonna be a dark moonless night uh, they got to uh, Kilvan Cull, the other side, the New Jersey side of the Kilvan Cull. Uh, they waited for the boats, but the boats never showed. Daylight came. Uh, all of a sudden, they couldn't do a sneak attack because the British guards uh, were out there. They they saw the the French and Continental troops on the other side of the Kilvan Cole. So the uh, the plan what had been to attack that uh, supply depot and then run away with all the supplies. Anyway, because it had been really cruddy weather, the New Jersey militia, which was assigned to bring the boats to the Kilvan Cole, 
didn't make it on time. So the boats never got there. Uh, daylight came, the attack was foiled and Lafayette retreated back to Montclair where uh, Washington was waiting with a bunch of a few regiments waiting to uh, do a sneak attack. The British knew that the Continental Army was stationed in Wayne and the area around Wayne. They would not have been expecting it to be in Montclair. So the whole deal was Lafayette was hoping to attack the supply depot, retreat, and have the British follow him and be ambushed in Montclair on their way to Wayne. Anyway, uh, Dr. Maurice Cohen uh, built a house uh, where the William and Mercy Crane's house had been. And in 1921, he honored William and Mercy Crane by putting up that plaque on the boulder. Uh, some people say that it is the smallest park in the United States. It really consists of the boulder, the plaque, and a couple of bushes. All right, we go down Valley Road to uh, Daniel and Mary Ziegler's house, which is also gone, torn down in the early 20th century. But if you're on Valley Road up by Kings and you take a look at 652 Valley Road, you can see part of the original house incorporated into the modern foundation. Another house does not look very old, does it? It looks like a 1930s uh, stockbroker Tudor house. But if you look real closely, look at those blocks. Those blocks are not typical facade blocks. Those blocks came from a house that was built in the late 18th century on that site. Uh, by Captain Abraham Van Giesen and his wife, Feiti, Feitia Nephis. Uh, Captain Abraham had been married before and his first wife had lived in Montclair. Uh, when he married Feitia, they moved from uh, Hackensack to uh, Montclair. Uh, Abraham had 66 acres at this corner, and this is the corner of Wachung and Valley Road, and his brother Isaac and his wife Maricha had 66, 66 acres at Bellevue Avenue and Valley Road. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this house and then we're going to uh, end up with, uh, we're to, we'll talk about uh, Isaac's house. Uh, in 1904, a guy by the name of Gustav Rader and his wife, Minnie, owned this house. Gustav was uh, Frederica Raider's brother. Frederica married Charles Hupfeld. And Charles left Frederica. Fred, uh, Charles went on a, uh, was a musician. He went on a tour of Europe. And he stayed there and abandoned Frederica back at home. Frederica became the organist for the Wachung Congregational Church and her and she built another house. She didn't, she never lived in this house. This was Gustav's house. She built a house on uh, Park Street. And her son, Herman Hupfeld, was the famous composer. And we know he wrote this famous song, As Time Goes By, that was featured in the movie Casablanca. This is what the house looked like in 1906. You can see that it's already been modified. They probably added a second floor. They built wings out both sides and they built a very 1906-like uh, turret wing. Sometime in the 1930s, it was renovated again and made to look like it currently does. Now there ain't nothing left of Isaac's house. Uh, all that is left, well, all that's left is the step stone that went into the house. Uh, we do know that Isaac and Maricha's Van Giesen's house uh, was the house where Lafayette stayed when they were planning that attack on Staten Island. 
Now I'm going to wrap up. We're going to leave Montclair and we're going to go to the oldest houses in New Jersey. Uh, I just thought this was interesting. I was a little stunned when I found out how old some of the old houses are. Anyway, long short story long. 1609, Henry Hudson, who was English, by the way, but he was working for the Dutch, uh, claimed he discovered the Hudson River, claimed everything from Connecticut to Delaware for the Dutch. This is a map of New Nederland uh, that was done in 1684. However, the Dutch tended just to live around the uh, Hudson River. That's the purple. The Swedes started to sneak in some settlements along the Delaware River and the Dutch weren't very happy about it. But the Swedes built some houses and this is the oldest house in New Jersey, 1638. It is the Nothnagel Log Cabin built in Gloucester County, which at the time was New Sweden. Uh, it originally just was this, just the log cabin here, the one-story log cabin. Later on, they built uh, an addition here. This is the inside of the Nothnagel house. Nobody knows who C.A. Nothnagel was. It's just, he's just the name, if it's a he, it might be a she, is just a name that appears on the earlier records. Uh, this house is also a private house. Uh, the people who owned it up until recently used to conduct tours, but it is a private house. All right, let's get back to the Dutch and the Swedes. The Dutch traded with the Len Lenape Indians, and those are these shades of green. That was the Lenny Lenape's uh, area. The Swedes traded with the Susquehannock Indians, who were lived in Pennsylvania uh, and Maryland. Okay, 1655 was a pivotal year in Dutch America. Uh, the Dutch decided they were tired of the Swedes horning in on their colony. And in 1655, the Dutch invade New Sweden and take it over. Some of the houses still remain, but basically the Dutch reclaimed the land for Holland. Incidentally, for no real reason, but it gets included historically. A Dutch settler kills a young Wappinger uh, Indian woman because she stole some peaches. Later on in 1655, the Susquehannock and Lenalenipi attack the Dutch settlements and drive the Dutch completely out of New Jersey. This was called the Peach War. Theoretically, the war was a uh, retaliation for this Dutch settler killing the young Indian lady, you know, young woman. In reality, it was probably the Susquehannock and Lenape getting revenge for losing their trading partners, the Swedish trading partners. Anyway, in 1658, after uh, a few years of nobody, nobody living in New Jersey, like no, no Europeans living in New Jersey, Governor Stuyvesant, uh, the Dutch governor, starts to repurchase some of the land at Communipaw, which is in Jersey City. In 1661, he authorizes that the lots, that it be divided up into lots, but demanded that the Include the wall. The, there was a the property be enclosed by a wall uh, and fortified, and this becomes Bergen, which is the first permanent village in New Jersey. Okay, so that leads us to 1664, when the SIP homestead was built in Bergen, lot 160. Well, I got my little camera and went down to Jersey City and took a picture of the site today. I don't see the house there. Where did it go? Well, it is now in Westfield. In the 1930s, somebody bought the house. I forget the name, it was a, it was a doctor and I forget, forget his name. Bought the house, 
did complete architectural drawings and moved it stone by stone and reassembled it in Westfield. Uh, so anyway, the house was originally built by Nicholas uh, Varleth, who married Peter Stuyvesant's daughter, Anna. So this is a WPA picture of the house, same house. It was in Westfield by 1933. Uh, some more pictures of the house, and you can notice the architecture, the curved roofs, the, oh, the steep gable roof. Uh, you can notice the uh, door with the uh, wrought iron, the hand forged wrought iron straps. Uh, Nicholas Farless was an important guy in Bergen. He was the captain of the militia, and he was the ambassador of New Netherland. This, sound, this sounds so strange in the 20th century. He was the ambassador to Virginia. But back in the 1600s, New Netherland and Virginia were totally separate colonies, separate countries to be exact. Uh, he didn't own the house that long. Uh, he sold it to the Sip family. I do not know how to pronounce that name. Is Johannes Andreinsen Sip and Johanna. John, uh, Van der Voorst, they bought the house in 1699, and the Sip family lived in this house for almost 150 years. Uh, this is yet some more views of the Sip house, and this is where I end my presentation. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? There was actually two questions, Mike, in the chat, so I'll start there. Um, one was, did they pay property taxes in the 1780s? Are there such records of that? In the 1780s, if you go back a little bit further, they were supposed to pay property taxes, not to the town, but to the proprietors. At that town, at the time, New Jersey was owned by 12 proprietors. The East, the, the, well, there were, New Jersey was divided, gets a little complicated. New Jersey was divided in half. There was East Jersey and West Jersey. There were 12 proprietors of East Jersey and 12 proprietors of West Jersey. They are the people who divvied up all the land, all the towns, everything. And you were supposed to, at that time, earlier in the, the uh, 18th century, you were supposed to make arrangements with the local Indian tribe, whoever they were, mostly Lenape, but there were other tribes here too. You were supposed to make an arrangement with the local Indians, barter, money, whatever, you traded with them and they would sell you the land. And then you had to have it confirmed by the, the purchase, confirmed by the proprietors. And you were supposed to pay a quick quit rent to the proprietors, All right? That was the early 18th century. Now about the 1780s, uh, towns started to develop and yes, you were supposed to pay property tax to the various towns. There was no such thing as income tax. Property tax is how the county was funded, how, this, how the town was funded, the county was funded, and how the state was funded. Uh, the United States mostly uh, depended on tariffs. Income tax didn't come in until like about 1914. Is that semi-clear or is that too much information? I think that was great information. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> this um this was just a, a question based on one of the earlier slides at the Van Riper house, just if that was a working well that you noted. Um it was at one time. Okay. 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 I doubt if it works now. I'm sure they boarded it up to keep for safety reasons. Right. A lot of I mean, other nobody okay. it had, nobody uses it now. Just right. like the, the well at the crane house is boarded up. You know, right. You don't want anybody, any kid to fall in it. Right. And uh, we had a lot of other chat and conversation going on. So Alice just wrote in the chat um, that her Lincoln Street house was built in 1877. Is there a map that shows 
um, that at the time. And Alice, the question is yes, feel free yes. to contact the Montclair History Center and we can get you some resources. I'm gonna put yes. our email in the chat for you. But anyone, if anyone has any more questions, you can feel okay. free to unmute or just type right into the chat yeah, box as well. I'm gonna add definitely the Montclair History Center has the 1871 map online. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have the 1878 map. I have that, a copy of that. Uh, so that house on Lincoln Street, if, if it was built in 17, uh, 1877, then it would certainly be on the 1870s, 78 map. Right. And so Carol, just, I'm not Carol, I'm sorry, Alice, send us an email and we'll get you connected to those resources for you so you can take a look. Um, because I believe you are our viewer from California today. So we'll make sure we get you something digitally. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts anyone would like to share? Oh, another um chat came in. Any information on the Bond family? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not here, not now, but sure. The Bond family. Um I'm having a little bit of trouble trying to remember their names their first names but i can tell you one thing for sure and uh they started bonds ice cream mm -hmm. uh which is where there's a bank there now but on valley road bonds ice cream was my favorite place to get ice cream uh in montclair i used to i used to live on pine street in montclair and walk up to um, the college when i was going to school at montclair state and I would always make a stop at Bonds. And my favorite was the chocolate chip mint, awful, awful. And awful, awfuls were huge milkshakes. A lot of people share some really Delicious. fond memories of Bonds. Oh, I loved Bonds. Anyway, the people who people who lived in the, in the Von Ripper Bond house, uh, and again, my memory escapes me uh they started bonds ice cream and we do have again some information on that so i'm gonna just ask you again use the email i placed in the chat because we actually do a walking tour of that upper montclair area and we have some facts that again i'm not recalling this second um about how the bond family ice cream pop-up started and then eventually morphed into that location mike's recalling so well the bank is there but they put a stone and a plaque in yep. front of the bank so Thank that you, you can you can you you can tell where bonds is i just instinctively instinctively remember where bonds was right because i stopped there so many times <laughs> yep awful big and awful good you got it mark <laughs> <laughs> i love that place uh, a question from Jeff, are any, all of these historic houses protected as landmarks? Um, while Mike slightly answers that, I'm going to pull up quickly a very cool um, interactive GPS map from the Historic Preservation Commission that can help you easily find such answers for any site or location in Montclair. So I'll let Mike answer and I'm going to go find right, that. Well, I, I, offhand, I don't remember all of them that are marked. Uh, I definitely know the, um, um, the Daniel Ziegler house on Valley Road, the one that's up by Kings, uh, that is definitely mm -hmm. on the state register. Um, you know, they're, a lot, they're not all on the registers, but some of them are. Um, it's, you know, catch as catch can. Um, the owners have to apply. Uh, not every owner wants to, wants to apply for the register. I mean, it, Applying for the state registry or the national registry is a double-edged sword. Uh, it protects the house. Uh, it doesn't make it impossible for the house to be knocked down. The house can still be knocked down. Uh, Montclair does have some restrictions on knocking houses down, at least a waiting period. Uh, houses have historic houses have been knocked down and they can still be even if they're on the registry the deal about the registry is it does help you it saves a little bit of money in taxes and it protects the house but the double-edged sword part of it is that the owner you can't change the exterior of the house if you want to build if you want to repair something it's got to be reviewed. It's got to look like the original house. 
You can't just slap another story on the house. You can't just slap another wing on the house. You know, so it's a kind of double-edged sword. So some people want the protection of being on the register. Some people don't. And what I just placed in the chat is what's called the historic inventory viewer. You can yeah. search by address and street. So even if a home is not individually designated, a home could still fall into a district that is designated historic yes. by the HPC. So that's actually just really helpful and handy for anyone who wants to look up any home or neighborhood in Montclair. And it's attached, um, some of which, if they have any historical documentation, it has that attached to it. And you can also view it online. So. Very handy. Yeah. Any other questions? Right. Mike, thank you so much. This was fascinating. I and mean, we all learned something new and a few houses I had no idea. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, neither did I when I started yeah. <laughs> out. I was amazed by some of these houses, especially that one on Watching Avenue, Watching yeah. Valley. Right. That doesn't look like an old house. No, you wouldn't think it. So that's you drove by that house a million <laughs> times. And now nah, it's a 1930s house. Now right. look closer at the stones. Yes. Those are 14 inch blocks. Right. They aren't that's not facade stone. Those stones originally belonged <laughs> to a stone house. It was at the house. And when I did the de de research, that's when I really was really became aware that there had been a stone house. Um, in the eight, mid 1800s, uh, the house was put up for a sheriff's sale. Sheriff sales, uh, the deeds on a sheriff's sale don't have to tell you who owned the house before, but they do have to give you an inventory of what was on the mm -hmm. on that lot. And on that lot was a the the, the sheriff when it was put up for a sheriff's sale, there was a stone house. So I know that there was a stone house at that corner since 1780s. Yeah, it doesn't look like it did, did back in the 1780s, but there was a there's been a stone house that corner for hundreds of years. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And we will eventually put this recording up on YouTube. And we usually announce that on our social media or email channels or on our website. So if you miss part or want to watch something a little closer, you can feel free to do that soon. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank